Welcome to this week's edition of First and Future Connecting in Crisis, a weekly program produced by NC State's Institute for Emerging Issues. I'm Leslie Boney, the director of the Institute for Emerging Issues, and each week on this program, we take on one of the big emerging public policy issues facing North Carolina during the pandemic. This week, connectivity. Who's got it? Who needs it? Why does it matter? And what can you do to get it? Thank you for joining us. We ask that you submit your questions to us via chat. We'll do our best to get to them as soon as possible. Our guest today will be Josh Dobson, a representative uh, in the North Carolina House, Angela Seifer, the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, Amy Huffman, the uh, Digital Inclusion and Policy Manager for the North Carolina Broadband Infrastructure Office, and Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Uh, Congressman Butterfield, when we scheduled this, we did not realize that the stimulus bill was going to be voted on a few minutes into the hour. And we know that you are as Chief Deputy Whip have a lot of work that you have to do over the next few minutes. So we appreciate your spending a few minutes with it. Thank you for thank you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, Congress is trying to get a lot of things done right now, and particularly in this next stimulus bill, a lot of emphasis on small businesses. Where does getting people online, particularly those who are not online now or don't have devices or don't have access, where does that fall in the list of priorities? Well, first, let me thank you, Leslie, and to the Institute for, for Emerging Issues for inviting me to share this time with you this morning by way of, of Facebook Live. Uh, as you mentioned, I cannot stay the duration of this webinar. I wish that I could, uh, but we will be voting today on an emergency supplemental bill uh, that will appropriate an additional $470 billion uh, into the recovery. I want to thank Representative Dobson uh, and his colleagues in the General Assembly for the work that they are doing. They are also back in session today uh, trying to deliver help uh, to, to North Carolinians. And thank you to Angela for the incredible work that you do. Expansion of broadband access is an issue that I have been actively engaged in now for many years. I pray that all of you are well. Uh, I failed to mention that at the top of the program. Let me go back and say I, I pray that all of you are well. Uh, this is a very difficult time for all of us. Uh, I want to give a, a special shout out to those individuals who are on the front line, uh, particularly our first responders and our healthcare workers. Uh, thank you to, to all of you. Uh, but as I was saying, uh, I, um, I have a deep and abiding interest in broadband deployment uh, across the country. Millions of Americans still lack uh, consistent and reliable access to the internet. Uh, many of us take it for granted, but so many Americans still uh, do not have access to the internet. Uh, this gap is especially evident in rural communities where a broadband infrastructure is simply unavailable. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has made clear to all of us the absolute necessity of a consistent high-speed internet connection for participation in the 21st century. While we are all adjusting to the new circumstances in the wake of, of the coronavirus, uh, those who still lack broadband access are having an especially difficult time, particularly with respect to those who need an education, employment, and health care. Stay-at-home mandates have forced millions of school children uh, out of the classroom. Uh, in response, school systems across the state and country are offering classes by way of remote learning platforms. Uh, here in our great state, over 1 million students must now find a way to access their lessons online, even if they do not have a fixed internet connection in their homes. K-12 students nationwide continue to lag behind because they lack access to high-speed broadband necessary to conduct research and complete their homework assignments. This homework gap, as we call it, is perhaps the cruelest aspect of what we call the digital divide. The longer that these young people go without consistent access to the internet, the farther they will fall behind their peers. Uh, the implications of the virus uh, for these workers who lack access to a high-speed connection are very severe. Millions of employees have now been forced to conduct their business remotely. My staff is working from home. I'm speaking to you right now from my DC home. Headed to the Hill in just a few minutes, but I am working from home. Uh, working from home is often only possible with a broadband connection. 
and in rural districts like my district, uh, many residents continue to make, uh, make do with a limited or inconsistent broadband access, putting their economic stability at significant risk. Now, the role of telehealth, let's talk about telehealth. The role of telehealth is becoming increasingly prominent during this crisis as hospital systems all around the country struggle under the strain of increased demand. Uh, you should know that we invested $150 billion in hospitals and healthcare. Today, we will invest a, another $100 billion into our hospital system. But all of them, the big ones and the rural ones, uh, are struggling. Accordingly, doctors are urging patients to use telemedicine applications as an alternative to in-person care. But it is exceedingly difficult to take full advantage of online health services without a consistent broadband connection. In my district in Eastern North Carolina, community health centers uh, continue to wrestle with serving communities where many residents lack the devices and the digital literacy and the infrastructure necessary to effectively manage uh, their care by way of the internet. All of this considered, our most vulnerable communities are in desperate need of access to broadband and during this unprecedented health crisis in particular. Earlier this year, I joined several other lawmakers representing rural districts to form a congressional rural broadband task force that is laser focused on the sole issue of bringing broadband access to our communities. And we have now drafted language that will provide, if it's passed, $80 billion to be included in the next stimulus package specifically for broadband. And we do have commitments from many of the congressional leadership that broadband will be in the next stimulus package. It's all subject to a lot of moving parts, uh, but it should be in the next package. I urge you to get involved and to help promote the idea among your friends, that, and including the lawmakers. Uh, that money would fund the deployment of secure and reliable internet connections for needy communities all across the country creating educational and health resources, spurring much needed economic development for rural communities that have been left behind. It takes time to build out broadband infrastructure. You just cannot flip a switch and, and it happens. Uh, it just takes time. So in addition, I've been advocating to house leadership for the expansion of wireless, wireless internet subsidies. As we continue to deal with the fallout of the pandemic, please know, that I am doing everything within my power to ensure that affordable high-speed broadband is made available to every part of this country in an expeditious, fair, and equitable manner. I am on the Committee of Jurisdiction. Please know we are working hard uh, to make it happen. So thank you very much for dialing in and being a part of this conversation this morning. Thank you to the Institute and to North Carolina State University for your incredible forward-thinking leadership. Thank you very much. Congressman Butterfield, you mentioned ubiquitous, uh, the word ubiquitous a, a little bit ago. And I'm wondering, there, there are some people who are talking now and saying that the internet may have reached the same status as electricity or roads as a basic piece of human infrastructure. How do you, how do you think about a, a question like that? Well, in the 21st century, uh, broadband is essential. Uh, it's just as essential uh, for the success of a family uh, as it is for them to have electricity, water, and gas. Uh, broadband uh, technology must be a part of every household and every business in America. We're almost there, uh, but we, we, we have some dark spots across the country, and we need to fill in these gaps, and Congress is going to appropriate hopefully $80 billion uh, to fill in and to get broadband in every community but it is essential. Uh, it used to be a luxury to have uh, the internet and broadband, but today it is essential. Now you've got to go, but uh, just a quick question on that. There, there appears to be, in an unusual kind of way these days, bipartisan support for increased access to broadband. When we start talking about things like maybe lowering subscription costs for people who can't afford it or uh, finding ways to get devices into homes. Do you think that bipartisanship continues there or what's the appetite you think in Congress? For there, is, there is bipartisan, bicameral uh, 
interest in broadband. I can say that to you. I cannot speak for all 535 members of Congress, but I can represent to you that that we we have bipartisan support for the concept. Uh, President Trump has talked about investing in infrastructure since since the first day of his administration. We've had conversations with with the White House about that. The hangup has been how do you pay for infrastructure investment? And now that we are in the global pandemic as we are, we are appropriating money for healthcare delivery systems and for unemployment insurance and the like. Uh, we can certainly add to that money for broadband deployment. And hopefully uh, once the crisis is over, uh, America will be stronger and better. And we will then be able to grow the economy and more people will be paying taxes and the deficit will begin to, to come down. Mr. Butterfield, I know you have to go. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think everybody will uh, understand that you need to go and, and make sure this next stimulus bill gets passed. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you. This is fun. I'm, I'm the type of person who would love to stay until the end because I like an intellectual conversation, but I do uh, have to go to the Hill. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Congressman G.K. Butterfield, uh, First District of North Carolina, which covers the central part and the uh, northeastern, north central and northeastern part of North Carolina. Uh, so uh, what happens from here is he walks across the street to his uh, to Congress and at 10 o'clock there will be a bill uh, that comes on the floor and will be passed and he was giving you some of the details of that. Another person who's playing an important role this morning is uh, Representative Josh Dobson. We're going to get back to him in just a second but I wanted to give a quick summary of where North Carolina was when this pandemic set in. So let's take a look at where North Carolina was as the pandemic arrived. There were about a quarter of our people statewide who had no laptop or desktop in their homes. Uh, one in 12 people had access to the internet only through a smartphone. According to the FCC, there were only about 5% of people in North Carolina who didn't have any chance of getting broadband in their homes. Uh, this is a figure that we at the Institute for Emerging Issues and other people have talked about for a while that uh, we think understates the percentage of people who don't have actual access. But in terms of the official numbers, uh, North Carolina is overachieving. Uh, we've got a greater percentage of our people who theoretically have access to broadband. Uh, our bigger challenges have to do with subscription. Uh, about 21.7% of households don't subscribe to any kind of internet, and a little more than 40% of people don't subscribe to broadband. And there's one more thing that's a little fuzzier, but it's a final thing that's going to be really important in the next stage of our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Estimates are that there's somewhere between 12 and 33% of our people, mostly older adults and people of color, who do not have a phone that is going to enable them to track their social contacts over time. Their phones are too old. And so uh, this is another challenge that North Carolina is gonna be facing as we move into the next stage of the response to the pandemic. Um, if we take a look at who's subscribing to broadband, uh, the state broadband infrastructure keeps up with where the biggest gaps are in broadband subscriptions. And it's in those areas that are should be showing up uh, on your screen in pink and orange, that we have the lowest percentage of people subscribing to broadband. And that makes a difference when someone is suddenly trying to get their children online or suddenly being told that they need to work from home or that they need to receive telehealth uh, over, a, over a connection that enables uh, high-speed transmission of, of data. Uh, this past month has seen more activity, getting more people online than ever in our history, as 2.6 million students started taking classes online, and the overwhelming majority of adults started to work from home. So in Testimony Tuesday, before the North Carolina House, North Carolina Broadband Infrastructure Office Jeff's uh, head, Jeff Searle, uh, outlined some of the immediate response that the state has taken. Uh, Nationally, you've heard that the FCC has asked internet service providers to take the Keep Americans Connected pledge to agree not to terminate service to anyone. On a state level, there's been widespread cooperation across agency lines, people stepping up, uh, trying to make sure that people get devices, people get hotspots, people get connected. 
At NC State, we had a concerted effort to make sure that every rural student got a call to find out for sure whether they had the connection they needed in order to do their online classes. The state agreed to speed up payments to recipients of the GREAT program, a program designed to help build out infrastructure. Um, and the Broadband Infrastructure Office also created an amazing map that is interactive, where if you haven't seen it, you can go to find out where people in your area could get free or reduced cost service for equipment. So if you click on this map, you can see the URL at the bottom, uh, you can find out where to go based on your zip code or someone that you're trying to help get online. So there were also a few mid and long-term responses that uh, Jeff Searle outlined to the House on Tuesday, just putting them on the table. Uh, over the near and long term, he's recommended free and reduced rates for internet access uh, over the internet subscriptions uh, until the beginning of the next school year. Uh, improved reporting so that we can find out who's actually underserved and has called for a collective effort to find a way to uh, create another 100,000 devices uh, in order to help people get online. He noted that there appears to be a homework gap deficit. These are children who can't get the internet in their home, uh, 197,000 uh, going into the crisis. Long term, uh, increased speeding, uh, increased amount of funding and speeding up of the deployment of the GREAT Act, passing of the Fiber NC Act that uh, Representative Dobson, who we'll turn to in just a minute, is the chief sponsor of uh, tax credits for IFP providers that are providing subsidies through the FCC's Lifeline program, uh, support for health insurance, paying for some of the costs of connectivity, and increasing the minimum speed of broadband. So some great work out there that has been done. North Carolina has been a leader in getting access, more work to do in getting subscriptions and uh, devices into homes. So as I mentioned earlier, Representative Josh Dobson is joining us. He too has a back-end constraint. Again, when we scheduled this, we didn't realize that the uh, that Representative Dobson was going to be asked to introduce the appropriations bill at 930. So uh, we've got a hard stop with him too. And uh, if you're like most people in North Carolina, you do want there to be an appropriations bill this year. So we need to make sure we turn him loose. Representative Dobson, you represent Avery, Mitchell, and McDowell counties. Even with all the work that North Carolina has done, in those counties when this crisis broke, only about half of the people were subscribing to broadband, and between 20 and 25 percent of them, depending on the county, didn't have devices in their homes. What sort of strategies have you been seeing since the crisis broke to get people in your counties online and able to connect to the internet for work and school? Yeah, th thank you so much for having me. Honored to be with you guys. Uh, it's been a struggle. It's been a challenge in the COVID-19 pandemic crisis that we've been facing uh, has only magnified the struggles that we already had in underserved areas of our state. As far as some of the things that we've, we've done uh, to, to the counties that I represent, to their credit, they had already uh, provided most uh, children with, with a computer in their homes to do their homeworks with. Uh, so that, that's been helpful. In addition to that, uh, working here locally, we've set up hotspots uh, throughout the county, for instance, at our fire departments, at schools, different places where uh, uh, adhering to the guidelines of CDC, still able to gain access uh, to high speed Internet at some of these hotspots across across our county. So it's it's limited and it's been a challenge. Uh, but uh, but admit in the midst of this crisis, we're certainly certainly doing what we can. We're a lead sponsor for a bill called Fiber NC that looks for ways that municipalities might jumpstart the building of broadband infrastructure in their communities, then lease it back to an internet service provider. Where does that bill stand now? Do you think it's coming back in this session that we're we're heading toward? And what happens next with that? Yeah, so we had a we had a bipartisan vote in the state and local government committee last year. It was uh, it was contentious. Now I, I try to always be on the level. It was a a uh, contentious issue in that committee, but I think it passed 13 to nine uh, with uh, bipartisan support. It then, it does have to go to finance. The bill is currently sitting in house finance uh, and it's a struggle. A lot of the larger telecommunication uh, companies have strongly opposed the bill, uh, which makes it a challenge 
uh, to get this bill moving. Uh, in the time that I have remaining in the General Assembly, uh, I'm going to continue to fight for this. I'm going to push the chairman uh, or, or, or work with the chairman of the Finance Committee uh, to try to get this bill heard um, in the short session uh, when we when we return to Raleigh uh, to deal with the uh, underlying issues in our state. You're also a co-sponsor of the GREAT bill, uh, which is uh, a bill designed to accomplish a similar thing in, in that it would extend access to more people uh, in North Carolina uh, to broadband infrastructure. There is a proposal to expedite projects that are already underway, and there's some talk about expanding funding for that in the coming session. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so in, in, in part of my frustration with this political gridlock, and I'm not casting blame, to be honest and transparent, there's plenty of blame to go around for everybody. Uh, but in the midst of the political gridlock over Medicaid expansion and teacher pay and those bigger issues, some of the, the most critical things that our state faces have gotten lost in the shuffle. And what I mean by that is in our budget that passed last year, uh, we, we appropriated $15 million each year for the next 10 years for a total of $150 million here at the state level uh, to, to try to get at some of these problems through the GREAT Act. Uh, but again, because of the political stalemate, uh, that, that funding was not appropriated and we're, we're left without that $150 million. So a bit of frustration there, but uh, we're going to go back in the short session and try to find uh, common ground and try to get a budget passed uh, that we can, we can get the, uh, the GREAT Act going again in this short session. I'm certainly going to work uh, in this budget uh, to, to make that happen. On some level, it's been a, an, an invisible problem for a lot of people in the state just because there's a great percentage of the state that's already served with access. And this crisis has brought it to visibility in a way that maybe nobody could. The same is true for these questions of subscriptions and devices. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Jeff Searle noted 197,000 households uh, fall into the homework gap, so meaning they don't have the opportunity to uh, uh, be online when their schools tell them their kids have to be online and they can't work from home in the same way uh, that they could if they had those devices or subscription within their home. Do you see this crisis changing that, one, the visibility, but two, the uh, amount of energy that people have to get things done in a bipartisan way? Uh, I sure hope so, uh, I, I, and, and I think so. As I, I think it is two different issues, the access to the devices themselves and then access to high-speed Internet. Uh, I think a lot is being done uh, across our state. Clearly, we have challenges. Your statistics uh, prove that out. But like in, in two of my counties, I know for sure the county commissioners, the counties have stepped up to say we're going to provide a device uh, to each child in our school system, uh, so they will at least have access to that. Uh, having said that, that does not solve the issue of access to high-speed internet. One out of every two students, despite the fact that in, in the high school that I went to, Avery High School, uh, despite the fact that every child has a device, has a computer, one out of every two students at Avery High School does not have access to high-speed internet. So even though they have the device, they still have the challenge of high-speed internet. Uh, and that's unacceptable to me. Uh, when I see students that I represent have to go to the local McDonald's to have access to high-speed internet, that, that's just unacceptable. And uh, I think a good example to, to, to answer your question further, uh, Congressman Butterfield represents a very different part of the state, a very different constituency that I do, but we're both facing the same issues and have the same challenges. Uh, so it is it has been invisible to a lot of uh, North Carolina, but it's certainly been visible to the underserved parts of our state uh, that do not have access to high-speed internet. There's some creative activity. You've mentioned some of it in the areas that you represent. Uh, McDowell Tech and Central Carolina Community College have both agreed to expand the footprint of their Wi-Fi in their areas. Uh, Google has put Wi-Fi on some buses in Caldwell and other counties and other places are figuring out ways to get it onto buses so that there'll be mobile connectivity. Uh, some districts, including yours, are issuing hotspots to students. Some are finding ways to get devices out to students. 
What have you been hearing from folks in your district about creative ways to overcome this issue? And, and how is that bringing the communities you serve together? It, it certainly has brought uh, the communities that we serve together. Uh, and I would say, in addition to that, in addition to the things that I've already talked about, creative ways, hotspots, uh, things that you just mentioned, um, I would say that this crisis has been a catalyst to the challenges that we have when it comes to high-speed broadband internet, uh, particularly with health care for our children uh, and uh, education and being able to teach and being able to interact online. So if anything, it has brought the community together and hopefully it will serve as a catalyst to, uh, to solving this as what I see is still a crisis uh, in North Carolina when it comes to underserved areas having access to high-speed internet. Final question, same question I asked to Congressman Butterfield. A couple of weeks ago on this program, Representative Steve Ross said it might be time to think of the internet in the same way we do a utility. Representative Zoka yesterday said it should be considered basic infrastructure. Are we at the point where we can think about internet in the same way we do about electricity or roads? I, I absolutely think we should think about it in those con that, in that context. And a fairness issue. Uh, it, it is not fair to me that underserved part of our states, uh, both eastern North Carolina, western North Carolina, and then and then some of our uh, the, the middle part of our state uh, do not have access to high speed internet. Uh, so it's a challenge. Uh, and some of these areas, as you know, are already struggling geographically, struggling economically, and trying to get jobs into these underserved areas. And you just add that on top of it. Um, it's, it's a struggle and it's a challenge. So I absolutely, uh, the answer to your question is, is yes. And uh, we need to do everything that we can to make sure these areas uh, in the next five, in, in the next uh, years to come, have the same access to high speed internet is the more uh, in the areas of our state where it's more readily available. All right, Representative Josh Dobson, representing the 85th District in the House. I know you've got to go introduce the appropriations bill. I think a lot of people are encouraging you, you to do that. Really appreciate your time and your thoughts and your wisdom about this. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. Honored to be with you guys. Thanks so much. All right. Um, so uh, I think you'll give both those guys a hall pass. Uh, one's passing the next stimulus bill. Another one's introducing the next appropriations bill. We thank them both for being with us. Um, we want to bring on two other people to react to this and, and also just share some of their wisdom. These are people who've been working on this issue since before anybody else was working on the issue. Uh, I think the North Carolina summary of what they've been doing would be they were country before country was cool. Uh, Angela Seifer is the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and Amy Huffman is the digital inclusion and policy manager for the North Carolina Broadband Infrastructure Office. Thanks to you, thanks to you both for being with us. Um, let me just have you react to what you've heard so far. Angela, what have, what have you heard that is encouraging or challenging to you? I think it's encouraging that North Carolina has such champions. You all should be like totally jazzed about that because not all states can, can can do a webinar like this and find a representative Butterfield, can find a representative Dobson coming from two different parties, talking about the same things. Gloria, I really wish we had that in every state. So, so that's awesome. You also have a state broadband office that is really a national model. Uh, there are so many folks in other states who wish they had an office like North Carolina's broadband office. So even though I know folks are frustrated with what's happening, there's also incredible momentum coming out of North Carolina. Uh, some of the stuff I wish we could adjust the language on is the focus on hotspots. Uh, hotspots are a great solution for the um, for the housing insecure, and they are a fast solution. Uh, they are more expensive though than utilizing where there is a wireline connection. You should really try to use that wireline connection. Wireline connections would be DSL, cable, fiber. Those are more stable. Uh, they tend to be cheaper than paying for a hotspot. Uh, and then that family would have that connection potentially moving forward after the the crisis is over. There was a story yesterday in the 
Henderson paper, I think, um, Henderson County about a family that had uh, three students uh, who were all trying to do their homework. They were all trying to use their mother's hotspot, which had data limits, and they couldn't use it at the same time because of capacity problems. So there was an expense challenge. There was a uh, capacity challenge, and uh, there was a timing challenge in that they were all trying to do their homework, but they couldn't do it at the same time because of the relative limits um, on that. Uh, Amy, any quick reaction to what you've heard so far in the program? First, Leslie, thank you so much for having me here. It's truly an honor to be on the same screen as uh, with Angela and yourself and Representative Dobson, Representative Butterfield. Um, even if we're not in the same place, it's still really an honor to be in the same place at the same time. Um, and thank you for hosting this. I think this is a great conversation um, and truly urgent. Um, again, I wanna echo Angela's comments. We are really excited and thankful for the strong leadership we've had, um, both from Representative Dobson and Representative Butterfield um, and um, all the hard work they've put into this and all the others that have come before us. Um, I do want to gently um, correct Representative Dobson. Um, the GREAT Act funding was part of the larger appropriations bill that has not passed. However, it was pulled out and passed in the mini budget last year. So we do have funding that is actually in the process of being um, will soon be in the process of being deployed this year, 15 million. We received applications from a number of providers um, and the application time has actually recently closed in decisions right now. The, the scoring and everything is happening right now to begin awarding those grants um, in a month or two. Um, don't quote me on the time. Um, so that's exciting. We do have money that's going out the door this year to help increase access. Um, those projects are, as Representative Butterfield mentioned, longer term. Um, building uh, networks takes time, so they're one to two years in length. Um, but we believe that that is a, a wonderful way to get access to folks across the state. Um, I also do think we should talk um, specifically about broadband subscriptions and how we can increase that throughout the state, um, as we do have a big issue there. And that while I do think hotspots are a good solution right now for some households, um, as Angela mentioned, I think it makes more sense where there is already a wireline provider um, to utilize that um, and to um, increase adoption of wireline in areas where there is that service. In some areas of the state, there isn't. There isn't a wireline provider. Um, so a hotspot may, might make might be the short-term solution for right now. But in many areas of the state, we do have wireline providers that can be leveraged. Yeah, so definitely some agreement from you on the chat. Uh, question from Drew Smith uh, from Facebook Live uh, about question of whether you guys believe that any of the challenges in getting the word out about COVID-19 is compromised by not having broadband into the home. So not having access to that information maybe immediately. Any evidence that uh, that lack of access is causing a lack of information, which is causing negative health outcomes for people? We don't have data that tells us the lack of information is causing negative impacts. There is a recent academic study that just came out that there is overlap of those who don't have broadband with those who are hardest hit by COVID. So the lack of information could be a component in that, but the research didn't dive into it. The part that the research did get into is that those folks are forced to leave their homes more often than those who have broadband are forced to leave their homes. So sheltering in place is more doable when you have broadband at home. Yeah, a lot of people criticize academic research as being time consuming and, and by the time it comes out, the crisis is over. This is a report that just came out yesterday looking at the yes. first month. Uh, so uh, kudos to, to those folks for, for turning that around so quickly. Um, let me ask Angela what you've seen come out so far from the federal stimulus bills and what you haven't seen 
So what have you seen that you like? What have you seen that you um, have? What have you not seen that you would like to see? Sure. So in the CARES Act, which is often defined as the third stimulus package, uh, one of the things that came out was 50 million for Institute of Museum and Library Services. We asked for 500 million. So we're glad to have 50 million, but it's not really gonna hit enough folks as it needs to hit. So we need more in the next package. What this money is intended for is connectivity, devices, and tech support. So I think in all of our conversations about the connectivity needs, those are the three things we need to keep coming back to. If we only focus on one of those, we're going to miss the needs of a lot of folks. So this money is going through Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is a federal agency, to uh, state libraries and then from and and tribal libraries, and then from there into the libraries themselves. Uh, NDIA is North, to- North Carolina's share of that, I think, is nine hundred thirty-seven thousand, something, something between nine and hundred nine hundred thousand and a million. I think. Got it. So we are, NDIA is encouraging the state libraries and libraries to not focus their efforts on the hotspots. Libraries are most comfortable and most familiar with hotspots because they had loaned them out. But if they focus their efforts on that, it it is the same issues that Amy and I mentioned earlier, right? We need to make sure we're getting it more uh, reliable and sustained internet. The next one is that uh, Medicare and Medicaid is now covering telehealth. Uh, So that's fabulous. But it comes back again to the issue of who doesn't have internet at home and won't be able to take advantage of the telehealth. Uh, So it it is still unclear. And because it's unclear, that means folks probably won't do it. If that money can cover somebody's broadband in order to be able to use the telehealth services So that means those who don't have broadband are less likely to use the telehealth services. And that means that they will leave their home to go into the doctor, which could put themselves and or others at risk. um, Then there's also been some funds that are going through the Department of Education that can also be used for connectivity. Uh, How how those will exactly get used and how Department of Education is nailing that down is still a little unclear, Um, but we have expectation that they will be used for connectivity. In many ways, there is an equity challenge in this. Uh, Can you talk about any trends for who's not included uh, digitally when it comes to this access, whether by race or geography or age? The data tells us it is most likely to be low income, seniors, people of color, A concern we have right now is that there's a big focus on K-12 access to internet, some on college students. So if you're not in that group, pretty much it's not a big part of the conversation, which we really need to rectify. Seniors in particular, for them, it could be a life and death issue to not have broadband in their homes. Uh, And anyone else in that in between there who is low income and doesn't have kids in school could be getting left out of some of the connectivity solutions. So the communities and the federal government needs to make sure we're considering everybody, particularly with the increase in uh, unemployment, that there are going to be, there are already more families in need than we've ever, than ever before. Can you describe some of the efforts that you're seeing across the country as people try to scramble to get people devices, get people connectivity, get people subscriptions? What, what are some heroic efforts that are underway that, that maybe we could learn something from? We're seeing some really uh, incredible efforts. Uh, NDIA, we often refer to them as our heroes, right? The, the heroes that don't wear capes kind of heroes. Uh, folks who are putting their own selves at risk because they are continuing to refurbish computers so they can get those into people's homes. I mean, they're doing it as safely as they can, right? They're all standing six feet apart while they refurbish. They're careful when they distribute the computers, uh, but they are still continuing their work. 
stories of uh, those refurbishers getting up super early in the morning to go buy the disinfectant wipes because they can't get them in bulk. So they got to buy them every morning before they go into the warehouse to do the refurbishing. Folks who are setting up hotlines so that those who have tech support needs have a hotline to call. That is really essential. Now, you can't go to the library anymore and say, okay, I have a problem. I, you know, my kid needs to use Zoom and I don't know how to use Zoom. You can't, who do you go to for that right now? So having a phone number to call is really essential. We're seeing folks set up programs that NDIA has been calling digital navigators, where there, it is someone who's already working with populations that are at risk, who can get on the phone with someone and talk through what are their uh, broadband service connectivity possibilities? What are you eligible for in terms of free or low cost service? Where might you find a free or low cost device? How can I help you with this particular issue you have right now? You need to apply for unemployment ASAP. Okay, let me help you walk you through that because you may not have had the digital skills necessary to accomplish this particular task at this particular moment. Let me ask you both, there's a question from Oita Coleman about learning loss. So people have been scrambling and people are generally impressed that you know we've been moving as quickly as we have and yet, there are a lot of students who've lost a lot of learning uh, over the ensuing period. Are there any strategies you've heard of to help people catch up from, from what they've lost as they've been offline or as we've been trying to figure this out? Um, un unfortunately, I, there are going to be some families who manage to catch up and some families that don't manage to catch up. I mean, that is it is really tough to expect a child to lead their own learning or a family member to help them when the family member maybe might, might still be working. The family member may not have those skills themselves. So the catching up part, Amy, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, I'm just thinking about my own son's schooling <laughs> and how I, um, would not call it homeschooling. I would call it uh, managing his work and making sure he does it. Um, but at, you know, at the state level, we our Department of Education is called the Department of Public Instruction, and they do have a digital teaching and learning division that has been there long before this crisis started. There are folks in that team who have. Um, spent many years pulling together resources for how to deliver education digitally um, and supporting teachers in that. And they're working around the clock to support our schools and our, um, our local education districts across the state to help them be um, ready to do this. I mean, the, the thing about it is, is that this is, um, these are processes that uh, could in some places take, should take years to implement. However, people are being asked to do it overnight. Um, so, so I think there has to be a lot of grace on the part of, stu of teachers and, and schools as they're setting these processes up. Yeah, so apologies for asking both of you that. I know you're not uh, necessarily educators as your primary focus, but it certainly is something that's on the mind of a lot of parents right now. And so it also provides some immediacy to solving this problem. And let me go back to you, Angela. So there, there are a set of people that are, are coming up with these crisis emergency solutions, but there's also this long-term challenge. I mean, the 197,000 uh, people who had homework gaps uh, beforehand in North Carolina, uh, if nothing changes, there are going to be 197,000 children with homework gaps when this is over. How do we, how do we address this in the long term? It's been pretty fascinating to see which communities were more prepared because maybe they had figured out some connectivity issues. Maybe they already had one-to-one -one device distribution within their schools. That preparedness, I think this is a huge uh, awareness time going on, right? And we, you know, some folks talk about the value of a crisis. We should not lose this opportunity to make sure because there is that awareness occurring right now, this is our movement to move, <laughs> move. And the fact that you have uh, representatives of Butterfield and Dobson on this means, oh yeah, yeah, like let's not stop because we have to figure it out this time. We all know 
there's there is going to be another crisis. So we have to be prepared. And we also know that we may not really go back to complete normalcy as we had before. I mean, it could really take a while. So let's um, let's figure out the home internet, which is the rural access piece, and it's the affordability piece that gets it into everybody's homes. Let's figure out the right devices, because uh, we all know mobile phones don't really cut it. And let's get to that tech support. That And then beyond the tech support, it's that digital skills building that all of us have to be doing all the time. Nobody's ever done learning digital skills. Uh, so that's an investment that has to we, ha we have to have funding for it. So there's somebody, lot, multiple somebodies, lots of somebodies to help with that again and again and again. Amy, what's your take on what the long-term solution for this is? Um, ditto everything Angela said, and I want to echo the skills part. Um, I think, you know, this is showing me, so my grandmother was trying to order groceries the other day. If she lived alone and not with us, she would have had to go and pick up groceries because she got so frustrated with how to do that online. So we need to make sure everyone has the skills that they can navigate everything online in the future. Um, we need to make sure everyone has devices. Um, we need to support our two wonderful device refurbishers in North Carolina, which are E2D in Charlotte and Cramden Institute in Durham and get them the devices they need to be able to refurbish and get out to households. Um, and schools that do don't have one-to-one -one programs probably need to go ahead and implement those and get those those laptops and computers out to their students. Um, but we're going to need funding. We're going to need sustained leadership. We're going to need lots of public-private partnerships and um, lots of collaboration at all levels of government to get this done and to continue this. There was a question earlier on the math. So we mentioned the 197,000 household homework gap. And then uh, your boss, uh, Jeff Searles, call for 100,000 devices. And, and some people were questioning the math on that. Why not 200,000 devices? And I wonder if you could just sort of sort through those, those numbers, because the, the homework gap was where we were before all this started. Is that right? That's correct. And I think the first thing to note is that that 197,000 figure is an estimate. So we do not have a current hard number on the number of K-12 households without internet um, throughout the state. We conducted a survey a few years ago and those these current numbers are based on, um, we assume that K-12 households throughout the state are um, experiencing the homework gap in the same rate as their county experiences um, subscription rates. That's a lot of mumbo jumbo to say we, asked, we use, used previous data to make some estimates. Um, so when you're talking about solutions, um, you have to um, use the data that you have to make your best um, guesses in how to um, solve the issues. The 100,000 number, um, I think, think came from some estimates from DPI, but I'd have to go back and check, to be honest, to figure out where that number came from. Yeah, some really creative ideas coming out on the chat. I'm trying to simultaneously listen and keep up with the chat, which is going pretty quickly here, but uh, some endorsement of the idea of digital navigators and even a call for the revival of the Civilian Conservation Corps from the Depression uh, with a lot of the people if you think about it, are currently unemployed, are going to need a path back on, that there may be a set of things that, that people across the country, either as volunteers or as uh, temporary government workers, might be able to do to solve some of these issues. Now, what do you think about a bigger version of, of the uh, digital navigators idea, either of you? Ooh, I'd love to see that. <laughs> uh, so far, we haven't seen chatter on that, but I think it's also a rapidly developing set of solutions being discussed. The idea of making sure folks have internet at home and the idea of them having devices is a much more tangible solution for folks to grasp. So I think that's why those are being addressed first. That third step of uh, a digital navigator uh, is something that 
is quickly developing. When NDIA first asked, we have 400 some affiliates, all independent organizations around the US. When we first asked them about this idea, we didn't even know what to call it, right? We were just describing the issue. Uh, and they all responded immediately. Some had already started working on it. Others wanted to talk about how it might work. And we put everybody on a phone call and mostly the phone call went like this. Okay, so what are your ideas? Uh, I don't know, I thought you had ideas. Well, how are you gonna do it? I, I don't know, I thought you were gonna tell me how to do it. <laughs> right? Like that's, that's how close to the beginning we are at this. We did, NDIA did publish a concept description of what a digital navigator is. So that's on our website, digitalinclusion.org. And we do have funding right now. To, we are developing a job description. We're developing all of that. But that's not to say others aren't doing the same thing at the same time. They are. As this, as this idea keeps getting discussed, it's going to get refined. It's going to, it's going to end up playing out differently in different places, which is exactly how that should work. So the more we can talk about it, the li more likely we are to get to some federal funding for it. Amy, we want to show the contact information for the North Carolina Broadband Infrastructure Office, but while we're doing that, can you maybe talk about uh, what the most exciting ideas you've heard from? Angela was talking about a deficit of ideas. What are, what are the most exciting ideas you're hearing around North Carolina as people are trying to address this challenge? Well, I think it's exciting. There are several folks that have jumped into the fray and into the action. Um, for instance, the Dogwood Health Trust funded some hotspots and some bus hotspots out in the western part of the state. Um, Digital Durham, which is a local collaborative in Durham, um, drafted a letter to their local policymakers to encourage them to address these issues locally in Durham. Um, Cramden, which is a device refurbisher, as you can imagine, they, they typically hand out um, devices to low-income families in large settings where there's lots of people. They can't do that right now. So they put a post on their Facebook page. Over 500 people came, and what they did is they set up one computer outside of their office on a cart, set up an appointment. Someone would come and pick up that computer, they'd wipe down the cart, sanitize it and everything, and 15 minutes later, another family would come and pick up the next computer. So they figured out how to do that safely. And in Charlotte, E2D is still refurbishing computers um, at a safe distance from each other um, in uh, one of their labs. And so we're still seeing people doing the work. It's just in a modified way. Um, I think you know, I think the truth is a lot of our work is being done for us now. Um, a lot of my work was building awareness around these issues. I no longer have to do that. No one is asking why the digital divide, closing the digital divide is important. Everyone truly understands that now. So I think as we move forward, we'll continue to see innovative solutions that um, come forward from our local folks to bridge this divide. We're gonna have all the slides available uh, for folks on our website as we post this. Just a reminder that uh, uh, Amy's organization, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, is digitalinclusion.org. The broadband infrastructure is ncbroadband.gov. Uh, Amy mentioned a couple of the providers that are out there. We have some information about those we can show for Cramden and uh, E2D. Um, and I'd also note that uh, the Institute for Emerging Issues has set up a special website that's specifically devoted to digital inclusion and finding ways to get people online. And that is chock full of information about uh, what's going on on a federal level, what's going on on a state level, uh, some creative things that people are using to uh, get students online, to get adults online, to get people connected to telehealth. So a great resource available there for you. Um, if you think about where we are right now, people need to be able to receive telehealth services. Most adults need to be able to work from home and all students need to be able to study at home. And for each of those needs, we need to find a way to make sure that everyone can participate, that everyone is included digitally. And that's the point that I think all of our guests have made. Uh, Representative Dobson called it a matter of fairness. 
Congressman Butterfield mentioned that there will be additional funding in this stimulus package, which hopefully uh, will begin to hit the floor in about three minutes. Uh, so please keep up with that. Know that uh, there's great information always through the National Digital Inclusion Alliance website, the Broadband Infrastructure Office, and through emergingissues.org, the website for the Institute for Emerging Issues. And with that, that's our show for today. Thanks to our guests, Congressman G.K. Butterfield, Representative Josh Dobson of the North Carolina House, Angela Seifer from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and Amy Huffman of the North Carolina Broadband Infrastructure Office. We encourage you to check out our web pages devoted to digital inclusion work and to subscribe to our uh, digest at emergingissues.org. If you have ideas about future shows, please reach out to me, L.N. Boney at ncsu.edu. Next week, we're gonna be focusing on challenges that young entrepreneurial companies are facing during the pandemic. This is a time to completely rethink how companies and businesses do business. First and Future is produced by Greg Hedgepath and James Herrick. Kirsten Chang helps get the word out about the series. Thanks to Caitlin Lancaster and Trishel Moore for their research work and to our digital inclusion team for their ongoing research and work on this topic. I'm Leslie Boney for all of us at the Institute for Emerging Issues at NC State University. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe. See you in the future.